Chapter 16. Ed Roush. Who is he, anyhow? An actor? No. A dentist? No. He's a gambler. Gatsby hesitated, then added coolly. He's the man who fixed the World Series back in 1919. Fixed the World Series, I repeated. The idea staggered me. I remember, of course, that the World Series had been fixed in 1919. But if I had thought of it, all I would have thought of it as a thing that merely happened. The end of some inviolable chain, it never occurred to me that that one man could start to play with the faith of 50 million people. With the single-mindedness of a burglar blowing a safe. How did he happen to do that? I asked for a minute. He just saw the opportunity. Why isn't he in jail? They can't get him. Old sport. He's a smart man. F. Scott Fitzgerald, the great Gatsby. Yes, I knew at the time that some finagling was going on. At least, that's what I heard. Rumors were flying all over the place that gamblers had got to the Chicago White Sox that they agreed to throw the World Series. But nobody knew anything for sure until Eddie E. Sitcott spilled the beans a year later. We beat them in the first two games, 9-1 and 4-2, and it was after the second game that I got a wind of it. We played those first two games in Cincinnati. Next day, we were, played, we were to play in Chicago. So the evening after the second game, we were all gathered at the hotel in Cincinnati, standing around waiting for cabs to take us to the train station. When this fellow came over to me, I didn't know who he was, and I'd seen him around before. Roush, he says, I want to tell you something. Did you hear about the squabble the White Sox got into after the game this afternoon? And he told me some story about Ray Schalk accusing Lefty Williams of throwing the game and something about, about some of the White Sox beating up a gambler for not giving them the money he promised them. They didn't get the payoff, he said, so from here on they're going to try to win. I didn't know. Oh, whether this guy made it up or, up or not. But it did start me thinking. Later on in the series, the same guy who came over to me again. Roush, he says. You remember what I told you about gamblers getting to the, to the White Sox? Well, now they've also got to some of the players on your own ball club. That's all he said. Wouldn't tell me any more. I didn't say anything to anybody until we were getting dressed in the clubhouse the next day. Then I got a hold of the manager, Pat Moran. Just before the pregame meeting. Before you you start the meeting, Pat, I said, there's something I want to tell you, to talk to you about. Okay, he says. What is it? I've been told that the gamblers that have gotten to some of the players on this club, I said. Maybe it's true, maybe it isn't. I don't know, but you you're sure better do something. I'm finding out. I'll be damned if I'm going to knock myself out trying to win this series if somebody else is trying to throw the game. Pat got all excited and called Jake Dubar over, who was the team captain. It was all news to both of them. So at the meeting, after we'd gone over to the White Sox lineup, Moran and looked at Odd, Odd Eller, who was going to pitch for us that day. Odd, he said. I've been hearing rumors about sellouts. Not about you, not about anybody in particular, just rumors. I just want to ask you a straight question. I want a straight answer. Shoot, he says Hod. Has anybody offered you anything to throw this game? Yep, Hod said. Lord, he could have dropped, you could have heard a pen drop. After breakfast this morning, a guy got on the elevator with me, and he got up off at the same floor I did. He showed me $5,000 bills and said they were mine if I lose the game today. What did you say? Moran asked him. I said if he didn't get damn far away from me real quick, he wouldn't know what it hit him. And the same went if I ever saw him again. Moran looked at Ella a long time. Finally, he said, okay, you're pitching, but wrong move and you're out of the game. Evidently, there weren't any wrong moves because old Hod went out, out there and pitched a swell game. One, two, the game, the Matt series. 
I don't know whether the whole truth of what, what went on the on there among the White Sox will ever come out. Even today, nobody really knows exactly what took place. Whatever it was, though, it was a dirty, rotten shame. One thing that's always overlooked in this whole mess is that we could have beaten them no matter what the circumstances. Sure, the 1919 White Sox were good, but the 1919 Cincinnati Reds were better. I believe to my dying day, I don't care how good Chicago's Joe Jackson, Buck Weaver, and Eddie Sitcott were. We had Heine Grow, Jack Dubbert, Greasy Neal, Rube Bressler, Larry Kopp, myself, and the best pitching staff in both leagues. We were a very underrated ball club. I played center field for the Cincinnati club for 11 straight years, 1916 through 1926. I went to Cincinnati from the... in the middle of 1916, along Christian Mathewson and Bill Mc- McKinney. Of course, I play, started playing ball a long before that, around 1909 or so, right here in Oakland City, Indiana. In those days, every little town had an immature club. So did Oakland City. Never will forget it. It was I was only about 16 at the time. Oakland City had a game scheduled with the neighboring town this day, and one of Oakland City's outfielders hadn't shown up. Everybody was standing around right on the main street of town, only a small town, you know, wondering what to do. When one of the town officials says, why not put that Roush kid in? I was kind of a shy kid, and I backed away. (sighs) That is a my quality, H12. <clears throat> anyway, but the manager says, well, that's just fine. what we'll do if we he don't show up in five more minutes. We waited for five minutes, and the, uh, and the outfielder never did show. So they gave me a uniform and put me right in right field. Turned out I got a couple of hits that day, and I became in Oakland City's regular right fielder for the rest of the season. The next year, of course, I was right in the middle of it. We reorganized the team, the Oakland City Walkovers. That's what we were called ourselves. We had a pretty good ball club. In those days, you know, I used to throw e- with either hand. I'm a natural lefty seed, but when I was a kid, I never fa- could find a lefty's glove. So I just fa- used a regular glove and learned to throw a righty. But left, batted lefty, but got so I could throw with my right arm almost as well as with my left. <clears throat> Excuse me. The year after that, we got in a quite a hassle. That would be 1911. It seems as though some of the Oakland City boys were getting $5 a game, and I wasn't one of them. I started raising cane about at this under-the-table business and treating some different than others. Wound up, we had such an argument that I quit the hometown club and went out over and played with the Princeton team. Princeton is the closest town to Oakland City, about 12 miles due west, and don't think that didn't cause quite a ruckus, especially when Princeton came over to play Oakland City at, at Oakland City, with me in the Princeton and outfield. A fair amount of hard feelings were stirred up, to say the least. I think... There are still one or two around here who never have forgiven me to this very day. I played with Princeton about a year and a half, and then a fellow connected with the Evansville Club in the Kid A League asked me would would I like to play for them in professional baseball. Well, Evansville, only about 30 miles from Oakland City, almost due south, and the idea of getting paid for playing ball sounded real good to me. And Yad thought it was terrific. He played semi-pro ball himself when he was young. William C. Roush was his name, a darn good ball player too. So I signed with Evansville and finished the 1912 season with them. I bought a lefty's glove when I started playing with Evansville, figuring I might as well go back to the natural throw. From then on, I always threw left-handed, because it didn't carry quite so well when I threw with my right. It wasn't really a natural throw. After that, things moved quick. Evansville sold me to the Chicago White Sox, of all teams. 
Considering what happened later, in the middle of the following season, I stayed with them for about a month. Sitcott was there then, Buck Weaver and Ray Schalk. And then they optioned me to Lincoln, Nebraska in the Western League. Next year, Indianapolis Club in the Federal League got in touch with me and offered me $225 a month, almost twice as what I was getting at Lincoln. So I jumped to the Federal League for for about two years. Federal League wasn't a, a bad league. Too bad. It only lasted two years. Ran into a lot of financial troubles and folded into December of 1915. Of course, it wasn't an out... It was an outlaw league, you know, raiding the other leagues for its players. The established leagues threatened that anybody who jumped to the feds would never be allowed back in the organized ball. But once the feds broke up, they were glad to get us. We had some good ball players there for two years. The federal league, he glibbed. A lot of old-timers jumped over, like Three Finger Brown, Chief Bender, Eddie Plank, Davy Jones, Joe Tinker, Jimmy Delahanty, Al Redwell, and Charlie Carr. The old Indianapolis first baseman, they didn't care if if organized ball never took them back because they were near the end of their trail anyway. But there were also a lot of young players like Benny Koff, Bill McKinney, myself. All three of us were sold to New York, the New York Giants, but then the Federal League collapsed. That's where we were reported in the spring of 1916. Me, I didn't like New York. I'm a small town boy. I liked the Midwest well. It wasn't exactly that. Not entirely, anyway. It was really McGraw. I didn't like John McGraw. I didn't enjoy playing for him. That's all. If he made a bad play, he'd cuss you out. Yell at you, call you, all sorts of names. That didn't go with me. So I was glad I could be when he traded me to the Reds in the middle of the 1916 season. I couldn't have been happier. John McGraw traded Christy Mathewson, McKinney, and me to Cincinnati for Wit and Khalifa and Buck Herzog, who had been the Cincinnati manager. Maddie wished to replace Herzog as the manager. And I still remember the trip the three of us made as we left the Giants, took the train to join the Reds. McKinney and I were sitting back on the observation train car talking about how happy we were to be traded. Maddie, on the other hand, came out and sat down, listened, but he didn't say anything. Finally, I turned to him and said, Well, Maddie, aren't you glad to be getting away from McGraw? I'll tell you something, Eddie, he said. You and Mac have only been on the Giants a couple months. It's just another ball club to you fellows. But I was with them, that team for 16 years. That's a mighty long time. To me, the Giants are home. And leaving them is like this. I feel the same as when I left home in the spring of the year. Of course, I re- realize I'm, I'm a, a throw I threw as a pitcher, but I appreciate McGraw. Making a place for me in baseball and getting me the managing job, he's doing me as me a favor, and I thanked him for it. And by the way, the last thing he said to me, that if I were put you in center field, I'd have a great ball player. So starting tomorrow, you're my center fielder. Well, we got to Cincinnati, and sure enough, right off, Matty puts me in center field. Greasy Neal was the right fielder. It was his first year with the Reds, too. But he'd been there, there since the start of the season, and of course, I was a newcomer. The first game that I played, the, there were about three or four fly balls came out there that could have been taken by either the center fielder or right fielder. If I thought I should have take, I should take it, I'd holler three times. I got it, I got it, I got it. I'd holler while I was running for, for it, see. But Greasy never said a word. Sometimes he'd take it, and sometimes he wouldn't. But in either case, he never said a thing. We went along that way for about three weeks. What I finally did was, was watch both of the, both him and the ball. If it looked to me like I could catch the ball and get out, out of his way, I'd holler and take it. But if it looked like it was going to be a tie, I'd just cut behind him and let him take it. 
He still never hollered and never didn't have too much else to say to me either. So I didn't have, have too much to say to him. You see, I could watch both him and the ball at the same time because I didn't really have to watch the ball. As soon as a ball was is hit, I could tell where it was going to go. And I'd just take off and not look at any at any more till I got there. So I'd take a quick glance at him while I was running. Finally, one day, Greasy came over and sat down beside me on the bench. I just want... I want to end this, this Roush, he said to me. I guess you know I've been trying to run you down ever since you got here. I wanted at that center field job for myself, and I didn't like it when Maddie put you out there. But you got go get a ball better than I could, ever could. I wanted to shake hands and call it off. From now on, I ho- I'll holler. And from then on, Greasy and I got along just fine. Grew to be two of the best friends ever. In fact... I made a lot of good friends those years I played in Cincinnati. Still my close friends to this day. I think that Cincinnati club from 1916 through 1926, one of the nicest bunch of fellas ever gathered together. We even had Jim Thorpe there one year. You know, by thunder, there was a man who could outrun a deer. Beating anything I ever saw. I used to be a pretty fast myself. Stole close to 300 bases in the base in the big leagues, and I had a real long stride. From the simple reason in the outfield, if you had, didn't don't take a long stride, your head bobs up and down, and too much, and it makes it hard to follow the flight of the ball. But Jim Thorpe would only take two strides to me to my three. I'd run just as hard as I could and he'd keep up with me just trotting along one day I asked him Jim anybody in those Olympic games ever make you really run your best I never yet saw the man I could I couldn't look back at it he says to me I believed him well sir I really hit my own stride those years in Cincinnati led the league in batting twice Hit over 350 three years in a row from 1921 through 1923 and generally had a ball. The lowest I ever hit while I was there was 321 in 1919. That was a good enough to lead the league that year. Won the pennant in the World Series in 1919 and finished either first, second, or third in seven of the 11 years. I was there, good teams, very much underrated, like I say, better than the 1919 Chicago White Sox. Of course, I hit very different from the way they hit today. I used a 48-ounce bat, heaviest anyone ever used. It was a shorter bat with a bigger handle, and I used to hit it in all fields, didn't swing my head off just snapped at the ball and until 1921 you know they'd had a dead ball well the only way you could get a home run was if the outfielder tripped and fell down the ball wasn't wrapped tight and a lot of times i'd get mashed on one side i caught a, many a ball all in the outfield that was smashed flat on one side come bouncing out there like a jumping bean they wouldn't throw it out at the game though only used about three or four balls in in a whole game. Now they use like 60 or 70. Another thing that's different now is the ballparks. Now they use smooth infields and outfields are all full of rocks. And they keep them nice. Back in the old days, there were parks weren't weren't much better than a cow pasture. Spring training was the worst. Some of those parks, they, they'd they want you to play exhibition games and, and had an outfield like sand and dunes. And others were hard as cement sidewalk. The hell with that. I wouldn't go to spring training, that's all. I used to hold, hold out every year until the week before the season opened. That's the only time they ever had any trouble with me. Contract me. 
time. Why I should go down there and fuss around in spring training, twist an ankle or break a leg. I did in my own spring training, hunting quail and rabbits around Oakland City, Indiana. After 11 years with the Reds, they traded me back to the New York Giants for George Kelly. That was after 1926. Well, I figured that was it. I was around 34, and I wasn't about to start taking abuse from John McGraw that late in life. However, I figured I had one chance. Maybe I could get John McGraw to trade me. January 27, the Giants sent me a contract for $19,000, same as I'd been getting with Cincinnati. I sent it right back and wrote them I wouldn't play in New York. A couple of weeks later, another one and arrived calling for twenty thousand dollars. Figured they'd gotten that hadn't gotten the point. So I wrote a letter telling them I wouldn't play with the Giants for any kind of money and wouldn't you know it, two weeks after that another contract arrived calling for twenty one thousand dollars. I didn't even bother to send that one back. Since they didn't seem to get the point the way I was doing it, I finally wrote that and said I want thirty thousand dollars I figured that would sink in, and they'd get the idea. Send me to another club. Spring training started, ended. Team began to move up north, playing exhibition games along the way. I was still busy hunting quail right here around Oakland City. One day, I got a call from McGraw. I would meet him in Chattanooga next week. I think, I was, after thinking it over, I decided, might as well. Arrived at the hotel, Chattanooga, at 8 o'clock on a Thursday morning. When I registered, the clerk said to me, Mr. McGraw left a message for you to come up to his room as soon as you arrive. Well, it was 8 o'clock, and I hadn't had any breakfast, so I went into the dining room and ordered a good meal. By 9 o'clock, a bell old boy comes over and says, McGraw would like to see you in room 305. All right, I says. I say, I'll tell him I'd be there. About that time, the ball players started to drift in, so I visited with them a while. One of them gave me a good cigar, so I sat down in a comfortable chair in the lobby, talked to some of the boys while I I enjoyed it. About 11 o'clock, one of the coaches came over. Hey, yeah, McGraw wants to know why you're not up, up there yet. Finally, by about 12.30 or so, after I finished visiting the ball players, completed a detailed reading of three newspapers, and had a haircut and a shoe shine. I decided to go upstairs and see John McGraw. John J. McGraw. What the devil's the matter with you, Rosh? He says. Don't you want to play ball for me? Hell no, I said. I don't want to play ball for you. Haven't you figured that out by now? Why not? Because I don't like the way you treat your players. That's why. First time you call me a damn so-and-so, somebody's going to get hurt. Well, listen. We'll get along fine, don't worry, he says. Yeah, I've heard that one before. Sit down, he says, and listen to me. You know this game as well as I do. You play your own game, and I'll never say anything to you. That's another one I've heard before. Well, he says... It's the truth. First time something happened out there and you start on me, I said. I'm taking off for Oakland City, Indiana. Why don't we stop all this horsing around? You just send me to another ball club. I won't do it, he says. I've been trying to get you back ever since I traded you away a long time ago. I'm sure you're either going to play for me or you're not going to play ball at all. I'm not... Not sure I don't want to let you go a second time. Okay, I said. But if that's the way you feel about it, if you give me my salary, I'll try it. But I'll say I'll be back in Oakland City, Indiana in 10 days. How much do you want? $25,000? I can't pay it. Well, I took my hat and started for the door. Where do you think you're going? He says. Back to Oakland City, Indiana. Why? Now, hold on, he said. Come back and sit down. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a three-year contract for $70,000. All right, I said. I'll take it. 
Contract went to the ballpark, got into uniform. Signed the contract, went to the ballpark, got into uniform. Played six innings that afternoon, got two hits three times, ends up two. Played three contract year contract out, and after that, I quit. Finally, did come back to Oakland City, Indiana. John McGraw kept his word, never bothered me. But it wasn't like playing in Cincinnati. I miss my teammates, and I miss the Cincinnati fans. I read where, or as far as the Cincinnati Reds fans are concerned, I am the most popular player ever, or wore a Reds u- uniform. I don't know about that. It's not for me to say, but assuming it's true, I'll tell you one thing. The feeling is mutual.